Good morning to Living Water. Uh, we're going to start our worship, so if you could come in, find a seat. If you need to grab some coffee or, or cookies, you feel free to do that. Um, like I said, come and uh, stand and join us in worship. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. My name is Gary. I'm one of the pastors here at Living Water Community Church, and I want to welcome you into this warm room. Out of our Iowa cold, out of our Iowa snow, we have a place that is warm. We have a place that is comfortable. We have a place that is welcoming because that is who our God is. He welcomes us in. He welcomes us into his presence. He welcomes us into his temple. He welcomes us into his throne room. And that's where we enter in today, to praise our God for blessing us with his son, Jesus Christ, who loved us so incredibly much that he died on the cross to save us from our sins. We, wel we are welcomed by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, that lives inside of this place. Knowing that God is here, knowing that he is present, we ask for his blessing on our service. And so, will you join me in a time of prayer as we pray together? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what a wonderful opportunity we have to be in your throne room. What a wonderful opportunity we have to gather with our brothers and our sisters. God, I pray that this time would be holy, that this time would be special, that we would not only meet you here, but we would meet each other here. God, whatever the week has been like, whether it's been good, whether it's been a struggle, whether it's been awesome, whether it's been difficult, God, we know that you are here, that you are standing with your arms wide open. And so we run to you. We run to you as our Father. We run to you as the only one who gives us hope, as the only one who gives us purpose. We pray that this time would be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock, you are our redeemer. In your holy name we pray, amen. As we begin singing, there are some blue cards there. If you're a first-time visitor, make sure you fill one of those out. If you have an updated email address or a prayer concern, go ahead and fill that out and drop those in the offering basket later on in the service. Let's praise our God together this morning. Love while angels. 
angels delight to worship above Thy mercies deep, tender, hope firm to the end Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend You alone are the matchless King To you alone be all majesty Your glorious and wonder will tongue can recite You breathe in the air Gratefully sing his wonderful love. Our shield, the defender, the ancient of days. We fail in his splendor, incurred with have a time of walking around, of greeting one another. But before we do that, I want to lay a foundation for us. Today, we're going to talk a lot about the relationship that God, our Father, wants with us and how that relationship means something all throughout the history of Scripture, not only in the New Testament that we're going to use as our main passage, but in the Old Testament where he gives us a Ten Commandments that we are called to follow. And so as a responsive reading, we're going to have uh, these Ten Commandments as a foundation for our study this morning. So I'll read the, uh, st- uh, the upper print, the blueprint, and then you respond with that bold white there. People of God, listen to the laws of the Lord that you may know his will and walk in his way. The God who saved us through Jesus Christ gave this law saying, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. We will worship the Lord our God and serve only him. You shall not make for yourself an idol of anything. We will worship the Lord our God and You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. You shall keep the seventh day as the Lord's day. You shall rest from your labor and your work. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. We are commanded to honor our father and our mother that our life may be long. You shall not murder. We will be kind and compassionate to each other, forgiving each other just as God has forgiven us. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not You shall not steal. And you shall not speak lies. We will speak the truth of our neighbor, seeking truth and promoting peace, and not devise evil against anyone. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. We will be content at all times through the strength of Christ in us. And so we will love our neighbor as ourselves.
This is the foundation that God has given us as Ten Commandments. Now, as he has greeted us, let's turn and greet our neighbor. And I'll also ask that those being installed as elders and deacons would come forward. After the walk around, we're going to have a great time of installing them. So they will come forward, and the rest of you greet one another this morning. find your way back to your seat and I'll ask Gawain Zomerman and Carol Kramer and Chad Postma to make their way up front here. Here you are. Right up here. Oh, everybody comes all the way up. Yeah. And unfortunately, Adri could not be with us to, uh, this morning, so he will actually uh, have to do this on his own. You guys get the benefit of being together, but he gets to stand up here by himself, right? And so, as you see there behind us, uh, the incoming elders and deacons as administrative elder, Adri Grunewig, as administrative deacon, Gawin Zomerman. And as care elders, Carol, and Carol Kramer and Chad Postma. And being a part of the uh, Christian Reformed Church, we have a liturgy that we follow through as we install these leaders, as we uh, have them make vows before you, before the Lord. And then also at the end of this, you will make a promise as well to pray for these leaders, to uplift these leaders, to make their job an easy one according to the Lord. And so we'll enter into into this uh, liturgy that we have from the Christian Reformed Church. It says, Congregation of Jesus Christ, today we celebrate God's gift of faithful leadership for his people. We joyfully thank him for elders and deacons who have served well, or excuse me, who are going to serve well and then will someday complete their office. And we praise him for providing successors as well. As we follow this, then, it also says, In the office bearers of the church, we see the love for Christ, the love of Christ for his people. As the Lord of the church, he appoints leaders, and by his spirit, he equips them so that believers may grow in faith. They may develop disciplined Christian living. They may serve others in selfless love, and they may share with all the good news of salvation. He taught us the spirit of true leadership when he said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but instead to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We find that in Matthew chapter 20. Now we intend to ordain elders and deacons and to install them for terms of service in this congregation. As we mentioned, those appointed to the office of elder are Adri Grunewig, Carol Kramer, and Chad, Post Chad Postma. Appointed to the office of deacon is Gawain Zomerman. 
And so, to express your acceptance of these offices, you are going to be stand and here in the presence of God and His church, I'm going to ask you to answer the following questions. And what I'll do is ask the entire question, and then I'll ask each one of you to answer with, I do, God helping me. First of all, do you believe that in the call of this congregation, God Himself is calling you to these holy offices? Do you believe that the Old and New Testaments are the Word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life? Do you subscribe to the doctrinal standards of this church, rejecting all teaching which contradicts them? Do you promise to do the work of your offices faithfully in a way that is worthy of your calling and in submission to the government and discipline of the church? First, I'll ask Carol. Carol, what is your answer? I do, God helping me. Amen. And Chad, what is your answer? I do, God helping me. Amen. And Gawain, what is your answer? I do, God helping me. Amen. Thank you very much. And uh, what it says there is just a charge for these elders and deacons. God, our Heavenly Father, who has called you to these sacred offices, may He guide you by His Word. May He equip you with His Spirit. May He so prosper your ministries that His church may increase and His name be praised. Amen. Now, as I mentioned a little bit ago, we are also saying goodbye to some of our outgoing leaders, thanking them for their service. And so we're going to ask... Uh, Oh, no, actually, first we're going to ask you guys your promises. We're going to ask the congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ to stand. And as I read through this charge, would you respond with, we do, God helping us. Living Water Community Church, I charge you to receive these office bearers as Christ's gift to the church, to recognize in them the Lord's provision for healthy congregational life, to hold them in honor, to take their counsel seriously, to respond to them with obedience and respect, to accept their help with thanks, to sustain them in prayer, and to encourage them with your support, especially when they feel the burden of their office. Please acknowledge them as the Lord's servants among you. So, living water, do you, congregation, pledge to receive them as you have been charged? And we answer, we do and we ask God to help us. And you may be seated, and the outgoing leaders, which are Wayne Dykstra, Mike Notaboom, Brittany Foreman, Roger Drogue couldn't be here this morning, but Laura Ekoff is as a representative of the CARE elders. Would you please come forward? And I'd like them to pray over you. Uh, sort of a passing of the torch, if you will. And we're going to ask God to bless your ministry, to bless you guys in your work. I believe it begins with Mike. Let's pray. Our merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for that you have provided faithful and gifted people to serve as elders and deacons. As these new office bearers assume their responsibilities, fill them with your spirit, endow them with your wisdom, and grant them strength. Make them faithful workers in your vineyard. Under their guidance, may your church grow in every spiritual grace, in faith which is open and unashamed, and in the committed service that promotes your reign in the world. Help them to perform their duties with enthusiasm and humility. In their work, grant them a sense of sustained awe which is rooted in daily adoration of you, their Lord. Through them, may your name be honored and your church be served. Help us, your people, to accept them gladly, encourage them always, and respect them for the sake of your precious Son, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sandra, could you bring those uh, frames up here? I have uh, something that I'd like to do as we say uh, thank you to these outgoing ones. Uh, we actually had the opportunity to pick out uh, verses that I thought were very special. And inside the frame, I just wrote a little note as far as why that verse, uh, what really moved me to think of each of you with that particular verse. And so Wayne has his, Mike 
and Laura and Brittany. <laughs> she has a blank one. She has a really nice one, but uh, hers is on the way, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, it's so sweet, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah, it's absolutely. So, just join me in saying thank you to the outgoing ones and welcoming the new ones. Would you please? And then you may be seated. Thank you all. Yep, you guys can go be. Thank you very much. I'll take your mics if you want. Thank you very much. Yep. And then we move on to the portion of our service where the little treasures may be dismissed. Actually, no, go back to that previous slide for a second, Devin, would you, before everybody exits. Uh, because one of the things that I really want to emphasize, uh, I've had questions, who is on what team, uh, who serves where, that kind of thing. I just want to run through this really, really quickly. Who is your 2020 leadership? And so for administrative elders from Orange City, we have Arlen Skop and Adri Grunewig. Uh, from Sheldon, you have Greg DeYoung and Terry Algersma. Administrative deacons are from Orange City, Spencer Grunewig and Gaywin Zoberman. In Sheldon, it's Brent Stoit and Andrew Wolgan. That makes up your council. And as I may have mentioned before, council is the one that is tasked with the overall vision, uh, kind of the 30,000 foot view of what is happening at Living Water. They are planning, they are hiring, they are staffing, all of those kind of things. And then on the care side, the people that are called to walk alongside you, to pray for you, to be there for you in uh, any type of emergency. From our care elders from Orange City, we have Ardeen Huseman who chairs that one, Terry Mao, Cameron Mulder, Renee Notaboom, Amy Stark, Rachel Tegrotenheis, Scott Vandenberg, Carol Kramer, and Chad Postma. And then the deacons who are meant to interact with Atlas, with Justice for All, with the organizations of the town, with giving uh, financial help if they need it, that kind of thing. Those are Danielle Koiken, Sue Lowers, and Sean Zwart. And on the Sheldon side, the care elders are Deb Johnson who chairs, Jackie DeYoung, Julie Julie Hawk, Cammy Jo Howery, Kirsten Pogue, Alicia Skimper, Deb Schmidt, Brad Tebben, and Nicole Tubergen. And then uh, what I want to do is just absolutely remind you that we are praying for this entire group as leadership of Living Water for 2020 especially. Be in prayer, especially tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow night we are actually joining together uh, as elders from the care side, as administrative elders and deacons to just really establish that bond between Sheldon and Orange City, establish that bond between the care side and the administrative side, and really just think of what it is that God has for us for 2020. So please be in prayer for your entire leadership. Be in prayer for Terry Elgerson who is being installed at Sheldon at this very moment as an administrative uh, deacon as well. So please be in prayer for your leadership for 2020. With all that being said, now uh, little treasures can be dismissed. That is our three, four, and five-year-olds in the back there, and they can go out for an age-appropriate lesson, and they will be led up to the upper room where they can see us, and they will be doing a uh, particular lesson that is appropriate for them. And as they do that, we are going to talk uh, about Ephesians, and we had a series start last week uh, talking about the family life, talking about relationships, and talking about how it is that we can see God work through these biblical principles of our relationships. And what I want to do is actually look at a passage that comes right after the passage that we talked about last week. Uh, I'm going to, going to look at Ephesians chapter 6. And Ephesians chapter 6 is from that uh, same idea that Paul had in Ephesians chapter 5. Remember when we were talking about Ephesians, I mentioned that this is a very general book. Paul didn't particularly know this church really, really well. And in the fact of only visiting once, only kind of getting them started, he wasn't able or he didn't feel the need to say one particular issue that was affecting that church. Remember, in some of the other letters that we see from Paul, he's going against some kind of hedonism or something uh, that the church was struggling with. In this
this letter, he's taking a much more general point of view. He's going through relationships. And if you pay attention to what happens before a passage, what happens after, he's going through what it means to be a godly husband, what it means to be a godly wife, what it means to be a father, what it means to be a son, what it means to be a child. And then he launches into what it means to be a slave, what it means to be a master. All of these relationships are covered in this book of Ephesians. And so that's why I want to look at this particular passage in order to talk a little bit more about parenting and to talk a little bit more about having biblical principles for parents and for children. But I want to remind you that asterisk is that this isn't just for parents and children. This is that general sense. This is the understanding of what it means to respect and what it means to follow. But knowing that we have uh, these words in front of us, knowing that we have to have the Holy Spirit in order to understand these words and let these words soak in, would you join me in a time of prayer as we ask his blessing on our study? Let's pray. God, this has to be you. This has to be a time where you speak to us clearly. This has to be a time where it's only your word coming through. God, I pray that Ephesians would do something that only your scripture can do. I pray that these words that were written so incredibly long ago have something to tell us this morning. I pray that they're not just words on a page. I pray that it's not just my voice. I pray that it's you. I pray that you would come through clearly. I pray that your message may be spoken, that your message may be received. God, would you translate whatever broken thoughts I have? Would you translate whatever it is that comes out of this mouth? And God, would you use it for my heart, for our hearts? God, there's all kinds of reasons for us to not hear you this morning. There's all kinds of opportunities for us to be distracted. There's all kinds of possibilities for us to be thinking about something else, to be thinking about somewhere else, someone else. God, I pray that just as we said earlier this service, we would have no other small g gods before you. I pray that that would be true in this very moment, that we would have no other idols, that we would have no other things that we want to chase, that it would be only you that we want to find out about this morning, that it would be only you that guides us and directs us. I pray that it would cause something in us, God, that we would be sparked to start reading more of your scripture, to start soaking in more of your scripture. God, I pray that this moment would be one that causes us to know and to believe that we are called to something deeper as parents and children. God, would this time be special? Would you send your Holy Spirit among us, I pray, so that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight. For you are my rock and you are my redeemer. In your holy name we pray, amen. This is a full passage, of course, and it's a fairly short one, but it's something that is having the ability to speak to each one of us, not just parents, not just children, but in an incredible way, a general piece of advice. And so I want to launch in on chapter 6 beginning at verse 1 and walking through uh, the first four verses. But I want to remind you again that I'm going to look back at a couple different passages, especially I'm going to look back at the Ten Commandments, uh, the things that we talked about, the things that uh, we set our foundation with, because that's what Paul actually does. And so beginning at uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. Children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now let me stop there for a second, because what I want to set the foundation with is that there is an understanding here. It's an almost 
uh, unspoken understanding that Paul says. And of course, just like the marriage one, we would love to stop in certain places, right? Uh, we would love to proof text or just take uh, some words just out of context. Just like the marriage one, uh, chapter 5, when it said, uh, wives submit to your husbands. Husbands love to push pause right there and to say, that's it, right? You have to submit to me as a wife. You have to follow what it is that I say. But no, there's an incredible context there. And what I want to remind you of is that parents, we cannot take this verse. We cannot just take these words and just say, children, obey your parents, period. Because there is a context. It calls us to obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And I want to set you an example of what that means in Paul's language, of what he's really saying behind the scenes of this particular passage. Because what he's doing is telling us that there is something assumed as a parent. There is something assumed that as a parent, you will be in the Lord. You will be following that righteous path. It would be one thing for Paul to simply say, obey your parents, period. Obey what it is that they are doing. But no, he is making the assumption that the one that you are following is going to be on the right path. The one that you are following is going to be taking the righteous way. The one that you are following is going to be in the Lord. Understand that as he mentions this, he is making the assumption that the parent is leading in the right direction. And so in order for the parent to be leading in the right direction, in order for me to say, follow the right path, I have to be on the right path. And in fact, that calls back to several Old Testament passages. The first one that I think of is it calls to Proverbs chapter 3. And Proverbs chapter 3 tells us that in all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. This language of following a path, this language of following the direction of God is laid out throughout Scripture. And especially as Paul tells the children to follow their parents on this path, he is assuming that the parents are first on the right path. As he talks to the Ephesian church, as he talks to us, he's reminding that if you can first submit to the Lord, if you can first submit to God, if you can first follow him, then that, ch that child will have a correct example to follow. I'm reminded of um, a movie called Facing the Giants. And if you remember that one, it was a, a fairly big hit. It was a fairly big Christian hit because it spoke of good Christian principles. It uh, did not use foul language, all of those kind of things. But what I found really intriguing was an interview that I heard with those directors. It was a brother team. It was the Kendrick brothers, and they were pastors at a certain church, and they felt called to make this movie. But as they were doing this interview, these two brothers gave an interview that said, we would catch our father at night. We would catch our father. We would uh, be sleeping or supposedly sleeping upstairs, and we would come downstairs, and we would see him at the kitchen table. And as they continued to talk about this, they continued to say what really made the difference in our life was that we didn't catch him surfing the web and seeing things that he shouldn't have seen. We didn't catch him just reading a sports magazine. We didn't catch him doing what he shouldn't be doing. We caught him reading the scripture. As we would sneak from our beds, as we would sneak down into the kitchen, we would see him laying that path and laying that foundation when he didn't think we were watching. And that made all the difference for us, they said. The example that I want you to know there, the thing that I want you to see as Paul begins this understanding of having parents and children both follow godly principles is that the parents have to be setting that right example in order for the children to be called to follow. It would be silly, it would be disingenuous for Paul to say, tell them to do one thing, but then go do another. All through our life, all through our actions, all through our words, we as parents are called to set this example. We as disciples are called to set this example. Because again, to go big picture, to go more than just parents and children, this general advice tells us that the world is watching. That every single person that is on this earth, believer or non-believer, has the ability to set an example. 
And you know that this is true in today's world, especially as our denominations face trouble, as our world faces trouble. The people outside of our circle, the people outside of the believer world are watching. How do we react? How do we act in a situation? What kind of thing are we caught doing? And as disciples of Jesus Christ, Paul is reminding us we are called to be the ones that are caught on the right path, to be the ones that are caught reading scripture, to be the ones that are caught praying, to be the ones that are setting that good example. We are called to a big picture. After he says this, he says, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And then he goes back to what we talked about a little bit ago. He goes back to these Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Understand that this is an exact quote of Deuteronomy 5, verse 16. As Paul is looking back at this Old Testament, remember we said it at the beginning of the service, and in Deuteronomy 5, we have this long list of the commandments that God is calling us to, and Paul quotes it exactly. And maybe, just maybe, I want you to pay attention to the fact that it is word for word. In Deuteronomy 5, we have, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. I want to remind you that in that culture, as Paul was writing this word, as Paul was writing this letter to the Ephesians, to quote it exactly causes us to say, this must be important. This isn't a summary. This isn't Paul saying, well, I think the Ten Commandments said something like this. No, this is Paul saying, this is what I have learned. This is what I have read. This is the scripture that I want you to know exactly. This is how important it is. And so Paul quotes these Ten Commandments exactly from Deuteronomy chapter 5, and he says, this is the first one that has a promise. This is the first one that has a retribution. This is the first one that has if this, then this. And maybe that's an important note. Maybe there's something that is there. Maybe there's something we're supposed to pay attention to. And I think what it might be is that this is setting up a pattern. You see, as Paul tells us, if you follow, uh, if you honor and obey, if you do those things for your parents, then you will live long. Then you will have the blessing of a long life. And part of the reason that I think he says that is because it's common sense. Because it makes sense that if you treat your parents in this way, then you're going to treat other people in this way. If you are this way at home, then you're going to be this way outside of your home. And that harkens back, that looks back at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 5 actually says this, if you remember at the beginning of the Ten Commandments. He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I punish the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But I show love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. For a long time, I was bothered by this passage. I really didn't understand this passage. In some sense, I thought, isn't this God being a little petty? Isn't this him saying, well, if the mom or the dad does it this way, then I'm going to punish all the way down that three or four generations. And I couldn't understand. I couldn't grasp. What are you really trying to say here, God? And I think what he might be trying to say is that it's simple common sense. Part of the thing that I think about is the fact that I'm a Celtics fan. And I just lost half of you. But the reason I'm a Celtics fan is because my dad was a Celtics fan. And the reason my dad was a Celtics fan is because my grandpa was a Celtics fan. And the reason my grandpa was a Celtics fan was because they were good at the time and he was a bandwagon fan. But understand that you just simply learn those kind of things from your parents. Think about how many interactions you've had with your parents and think about how many ways that they have done a certain thing and think about the fact that you do that certain thing much in the same way. Maybe it's the way they eat their toast. Maybe it's the uh, times that you go out to eat. Maybe it's uh, a certain prayer that you say all the time. Whatever it is, those patterns are set up and almost unknowingly you follow those patterns. And that's the same kind of example that we have here in this passage. 
This is how he punishes to the third and fourth generations. And this is how he shows love to a thousand generations. Understanding that if a good example is set up, then obviously that good example is going to naturally continue on. If the bad example is set up, then unknowingly that bad example is going to continue on. And so how, how important is it for us as parents, for us as disciples to set that good example and to continue that good chain? And I have to give a little asterisk here. I have to say that, of course, there are these negative chains, whether it's an addiction, whether it's something that you hold on to, there are those negative chains. And I want to praise God because you are not locked in to that chain. Please, please hear that. You are not locked in to those same sins. Only Jesus Christ can break a chain. Amen? Knowing that those negative things can become positive things. We've talked about this before. He can bring life out of something that is dead. He can see that your parents are setting a bad example. And by the grace of God, you can rely on the Holy Spirit and you can break that chain. And by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can continue a good chain. That means we follow the example that we have been given, that means we set up a good example. And this is the kind of retribution that he talks about in that passage. This is the kind of retribution that continues on. And that's why he says this is the first one with a promise. This is the first one that calls back to if this, then this. After he quotes the Old Testament, after he quotes the Ten Commandments, he says this, Father's do not exasperate your children. And that word exasperate in several different translations in several different ways is also called do not provoke. Do not make angry your children. Do not poke the bear, so to speak. And this becomes especially important with teenagers. Poking the bear, provoking, making angry has something to do with not leading in that right path. Do not exasperate your children, but instead, instead, pay attention to the fact that instead means that exasperating is one direction, but what he's about to say is the completely opposite direction. It doesn't mean that sometimes you get to provoke, sometimes you get to say these things. I've been called out, I've been uh, convicted by this. Uh, I can't remember if it was a sermon, if we heard it somewhere, but just little tiny comments, right? And I am getting bad at this and I'm trying to undo it, but uh, one of the kids will make something wrong, one of the kids will do something wrong, and will say, oh, way to go, genius. And just that little bit of sarcasm, just that little bit of sarcasm can really, really hurt. And that's provoking. That's making angry what I shouldn't be making angry. That's exasperating when I shouldn't be exasperating. Instead of doing that, we go the opposite way and we do something other than exasperate. We do something other than poke the bear. We do something other than provoking. And Paul even tells us what that other is. Instead of exasperating, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. I love it because Paul uses these phrases quite often. The training, the instruction of the Lord. The training meaning that you are getting ready for something. Remember that Paul uses this exact same language in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians. And as he goes to 1 Corinthians, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize, so, that, so run that you may obtain it? Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one that is beating the air, but instead I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself would be disqualified. Understand that Paul is using this same language as he does in Ephesians, reminding us that we are getting ready for something Remind, uh, reminding us that we are preparing for something. Reminding us that our children are preparing for something. If you have not seen, if you have not known, then this world is full of negativity. This world is full of difficulty. This world is really the battle. And as parents, as disciple makers, we are called to set the example in order to train for that battle. 
In order to be ready to accomplish things for this kingdom, there has to be a good example set up. In order to accomplish things for this kingdom, there has to be a training program. How purposeful must that be then? How purposeful do we have to be rather than just say, ah, oh, we're going to get through these first few years. We're going to get through the teenage years. We're going to get through this difficult time. No, no, no. This is with a purpose. This is parenting and discipling and being a child with a purpose of accomplishing that training, of accomplishing what God is asking us to be. There are times when we have days of surviving Every parent knows this. Every child knows this. There's times when we're not getting along. There's times when things aren't going correctly. But I would love for my hope and my prayer, for your hope and your prayer, to make 2020 a time of thriving, a time of being purposeful in our training, a time of writing out what it is that we want to accomplish as parents and children, of setting goals as parents and children, of knowing that we desire to further his kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, we can't do this parent thing alone. We can't do this child thing alone. We can't even, we can't even be without your direction, without your purpose, without your guidance. God, I know that calling us to be disciples, calling us to be the ones that set the example seems incredibly silly. You call sinners, you call broken people, you call the needy to be parents, to be leaders, to be those who lead your people, Moses. You call us to be the ones who guide your people, Moses and Joshua and Abram. God, we are in that long line and so I pray that you would equip us. I pray that you would give us the strength that we stand in need of so that our example may be a righteous one, so that we are found on that righteous path. God, may we be in you as you are in us. We pray this in your holy, holy, holy name. Amen. You stand with us as we continue in worship.
Father, he calls us to respond to the love that he has shown. He calls us to respond by starting with our tithes and our offerings. He asks us to simply start with 10%, knowing that it is all his in the first place, knowing that he gives us everything we have. We give back, knowing that we are furthering the kingdom of God. A reminder that if you have a prayer concern, if you have an updated email address, fill this out and drop it in that offering basket as well. We'll take our offering during this next song. you 
as we seek to follow after the Lord, a reminder that during the month of January, after the service, we are gathering right back here in the worship center for overtime, meaning that about five or 10 minutes after you grab your coffee and make your way back up here, we're gonna watch one of the training sessions from Right Now Media. Right Now Media has a huge library of things that'll help you biblically along your parenting, along your being a child, along your Bible study. So make sure that if you can't join us here. You're checking out this free gift from Living Water, which you can find on our website for all who thirst. Dot com. It's Right Now Media. Now, one more reminder that a couple of months ago, uh, we offered during one of our sermon series a chance to live out what we are being called to. And one of those offerings was uh, a JFA trip, a Justice for All trip. And that was going with Dale and Deb Schmidt. If you remember, they were up here and telling us about this trip that they were taking to Mexico. And as we offered that to the Sheldon and the Orange City campus, we had several people from both campuses that said, yes, I want to go on this trip. I want to be blessed and, and I want to be a blessing. And so I'd like to ask Dan Foreman to come up. He's one of them that said yes. And I want to pray over him as a representative of praying over that trip, of praying over the people that are going to serve and the people that are going to be served. So would you join me in prayer as we ask a blessing on those that are taking that trip? Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I thank you for those that have said yes. I thank you for the ability to say yes to what it is that you are tapping on the shoulder with. God, I pray a blessing on Dan. I pray a blessing on all of the people that are going. I pray that you would protect them. I pray that you would give them your light so that they can shine. God, I pray that somehow, some way, your word would be spoken, not just through words, but through actions. Would you bless the trip? Would you bless the outcome of the trip? Would you bless all of every single part of this next week? God, I pray that it would be your will that is done. I pray that your will would be seen in your holy, holy, holy name we pray. Amen. And so Dan's going to probably stand up here for a couple minutes in case anybody wants to ask you about it. Is that all right? And you can kind of give a couple details. Uh, so if you're wondering what that trip is, uh, what they are going to be doing, come and talk to Dan a little bit. And if you are in need of prayer, if you are in need of something uh, that the Holy Spirit has tapped you on the shoulder with, there are people in the back that are ready, willing, and able to pray for you and with you. Now, as you go, take this blessing with you. May the God of all grace, after you have suffered a little while, himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. Now unto him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.